<laughs> Welcome to Aspects of Writing. I'm your host, James Kelly, and my co-host is Janet Corsi. And today we have with us Marissa Hunt and Haley Harper, and they're the host of Authors in Training. And we also have author Lori, uh, is it? Petrowski. Petrowski. I, I probably knew that, and I should have said it. Petr- That's okay. Petr- Petrowski. Petrowski. <laughs> and the topic of the show is the importance of research. Great start. <laughs> I guess I didn't do mine. Um, but anyway. <laughs> learning how to pronounce people's names is very, uh, I, is very much part of this. But <laughs> Marissa and Haley, how did you come about uh, with this idea of your podcast? Well, it first started with my dad because he had an idea of starting a uh, like multiple podcasts under one company and it'd just be different podcasts about different arts. So he started with me and he just like, Hey Haley, do you, uh, do you want to do a podcast about writing with Marissa? And I was like, sure. And yeah, that's kind of how it started. So your dad does podcast as well. No, uh, oh. no, <laughs> no, okay. no. Now it's getting interesting. Yeah. yeah. He just, he, he just really likes the arts okay. and he just had that idea that he just wanted to do. I don't know. If it's still a plan that he has, or if it's kind of pushed to the wayside, but you know, we just kept doing autism training because we like it. All right. So, how long have you guys been doing this? Um, we're actually reaching our one year anniversary in July, July eighth. All right. And I'm going to ask uh, Marissa, how long? What are you guys working on? You're also working on some writing. Uh, yes, we're uh, co-writing a book right now. <laughs> okay. Where it's a mystery low fantasy novel, and we split up the characters so that. Um, each of us has something to do and makes the world more immersive. Okay. Yeah. And, all right, so c- can you give us an idea what it is? What's the title? The title is The Crimson Ace, and, okay. you know, it's Haley's turn to do this. No. <laughs> yeah, you knew that was coming. <laughs> I, you made your last you, time. I thought I'd avoid it. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Take turns. Well, it's about Ashton Rogue, who returns to his hometown of Dwalin to become the new captain of the guard, and the first thing the king assigns him to do is to find the white rabbit which is an informant who has stolen secrets from the kingdom and is threatening to uh you know tell other people which they obviously can't have that so he goes on this journey to find her and he has the help of uh will fedora who is a hat maker but he's also the leader of a um what's it called i can't think of the word rebel group Yes, a rebel group. Obviously, he doesn't know that yet. Um, and then Fabs Nebulum, who is the uh, political advisor to the king, but she's caged within the kingdom and she can't leave. So is this like an Alice in Wonderland type thing? Yeah, we, it's, it's an, loosely based. Yeah. Okay. All Does right. it have a, a time frame of when it's happening? Um, it's kind of in another world, but we based it off of like Victorian era. Uh-huh. But she means when when you have this plan. When what is your your expectations of getting this work out there that wasn't my question no but oh. she answered the question but <laughs> oh, yeah. now now answer now answer james questions because now i'm really interested in that. Um. <laughs> one of you, come on one of you has to know it's Russ's turn to answer wait is your question like when's it going to be released yeah yeah okay we're projecting it to um come out uh next uh june in the summer of 2019 okay uh-huh. with all the edits we have to do and um because again, uh, we told you guys earlier, but our audience doesn't know this. We started this book when we were seventeen, and when you do, when you start that at that age, you play a lot of catch up because there's a lot of things people don't tell you until you learn it yourself. And so, how old are you now? I'm 22. Haley's 21. Wow! So uh-huh. you started that eons ago. Eons. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. <laughs> I have books older than you too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So where can we learn about your podcast? Where is where is your podcast? Where can we find it? Um, you can find it on Podbean. Uh, you could also find it on iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn, and soon enough, it'll be on Google Play Music, too. Okay, and we're going to talk more about it in a little bit, mm-hmm. but I'd like to introduce our next guest, and that's Lori Petrowski. Very good. <laughs> All right, good. And Lori's <laughs> latest book. <laughs> Her latest book is Revolutionary Spirit, mm-hmm. The Molly Weston Chronicles. And Lori, you earned a master's degree in Romance Languages from Ohio State University, mm-hmm. and your first job was in publishing. And later on, you moved into the corporate communications, and you went into architectural photography, public relations, Mm -hmm. and then you were teaching. You teach Spanish. Do you still teach Spanish and Portuguese? I do teach uh, primarily Spanish these days. Um, 
every once in a while I'll fill in for Portuguese, but uh, okay. that's been a while now, but mostly wow. por- uh, Spanish. And I, a wow. lot of people don't know that there there is a close, re- you know... It is very close, and the one thing that I found after I, I had the opportunity to live in Spain when I was a, a teenager, when you guys started writing, I was living in Spain. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> but uh, later on, when I, I studied Portuguese, I realized that most everybody who speaks Portuguese can understand Spanish, but it doesn't work the other way around. Okay. Ah, mm-hmm. interesting. Well, tell us about your books, and, and how many books... I've got two books. Let me show you right here. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Revolutionary Heart came out in uh, 2015, and I really thought I'd, I'd get uh, Revolutionary Spirit out quicker than I did, but I had some other obligations that, that filled in some of that time. But it was really interesting. It was, it's a, it's a, a love of, of heart for me, truly. Uh-huh. I had this idea when I was uh, about Hallie and Marissa's age. And I had started writing some of the pages, and then I put it away. So that was uh-huh. about two or three years ago? Yeah, okay. four. Yeah. four. <laughs> <laughs> but I kept coming back to it, and I'd, I'd, I'd read it, and it's like, you yeah, know, that's pretty good. And I'd send it to my sister. She says, Lori, that's really good. I'd have my husband read it. Lori, that's really good. And I'd put it back in my drawer, and finally one day I picked it up, and I said, Dang, this is really good. <laughs> <laughs> well, happened. you have to I believe gotta in do it. This. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had to believe in it. But I also felt that the, the timing wasn't right. You know, everything in its own time. Right. Yeah. And I think I had to mature as a person to be able to write the story that it's become. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Wow. And your husband's here. We, we, he's yes. not on camera, but he is here in the studio with us. Hi, babe. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't have your cats with us. How many cats do you have? Well, at the time I had five. I'm down to three now. Oh, oh wow. Yes, but yeah. th- they are all rescues. They seem to know that ours is the house to go to if they're in trouble. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, yeah. and, and, you know, we've, we've been talking. You know, we're down to three. We're, don't, don't tell the, the city on us. Right? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we just have this feeling that, there's another one coming. Ah. So, so we'll see what happens. Maybe it's there the one that's at is. my house. <laughs> 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 I'm not joking. <laughs> there's no, a definite need there, I just, yes. I just rescued a cat from uh, uh, someone I take care of, an elderly lady. She's um, not going to be able to go home, so I had to take her cat and do something with it. So she's at my house for now, even though I'm allergic to cats. And I have to tell you, I brought the cat home, thought, I, I have two little dogs, let them out, and I thought the cat got out. For two days, I'm looking for this cat, putting up posters all over the place. Oh, no. <laughs> and it had hidden in the house underneath a cupboard, which I did not think it could even get to. Oh, they oh, have yeah. places. <laughs> yeah, that they makes have sense. Places. My cat hides in, we have a, a grill, and there's a door to get to. Yeah. And there's spaces, because we never really turn it on. It's very rare that we cook it. So he'll sleep in there. And yeah. Just, yeah. You're walking yeah. by, he'll burst through the door like, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and the first time we got him, he hid behind the... Um, I think he hid behind like the dishwasher. We don't even know how he got back there, but he just decided, <laughs> yeah, I don't like you guys. So right, for yeah, the past yeah. two days, that's what he did. He's yeah. a rescue as well. Truly. Well, I want to ask Lori, where can we yeah. learn more about your work? Right. I have a website. It's lauripetrowski.com. L-O-R-I-P as in Peter. I-O-T as in Tom. R-O-W-S-K-I. Okay, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> and, and ladies, did I ask you, Marissa and, and Haley, do you have a website? Uh, we kind of use Podbean as our website. So if you go to uh, authorsintraining.podbean.com. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> well, we're going to be talking about, um, of course, the topic of the show is the importance of research. And we do a lot of research. I know I do. For my radio show, I'm, I did a lot of research today. Um, just to get the answers for the research. <laughs> <laughs> I researched, literally researched research. Uh, <laughs> Got to start somewhere. Well, so I did too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to read a couple things here, and then we're going to talk about it as we go, because we're going to be using it from both the perspective of everything we do, no matter mm-hmm. what we do when we're writing. All right, the following is from the blog by Joanna Penn. When does research become a bad thing? When, uh, when writers use it as an excuse not to start writing yet? There are writers who have spent 10 years researching a novel, but not only did they not require the or exhaust the background work, I can't even read today. <laughs> uh, it would have been better off without it. And I guess what she's getting at there is some research we can over research. That's, That's what true. I do. That's yeah, true. and I did that. I, I literally had nine pages on research, and I was telling Jen, 
when I was <laughs> pulling this all together. Nine pages for this. Yes. yes. Oh okay. my gosh. <laughs> and, and it's hard to know because when you're out there on the internet and you're doing research, everybody's got an opinion. Yeah. True. So True. it's really hard to know where to go. So he said to me, Jan, can you edit this down for me a little bit? And I mm. said, sure. And I took the last six pages and I tore <laughs> it <them> up. <laughs> oh, I wish I was there to see that. <laughs> Great. <laughs> See, yeah. see that uh, just goes to show if you're not, if you're not connected to it, it's really easy to edit. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, I must skip down here. To research has its rightful place in the novel writing process, and it is uh, fact mm -hmm. vital to many uh, kinds of story stories. Sorry, the key to keeping it under control is to understand that there are actually two kinds of research for the novelist: to know which kind should be done and when, and to know when not to research at all. And Lori, you've been doing yours for a while, so you've done a, probably extensive research. I have, and I did kind of run into this issue because it it is I, historical research. My my novel takes place. It starts off in 1765, Boston. Okay. So right right before the uh, revolution begins, just literally uh -huh. a days when the Stamp Act is announced. And this is my favorite period of history. So I figured I know everything about this, right? Because I've been reading for all my life. All uh -huh. of a sudden, I realized. Um, I know what they look like when you know they wear their clothes, but what are those clothes called? Uh, right. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah. That is that is a problem. Yeah. What 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 are they eating? Yes. What are they drinking? Yep. What what does the inside of the house look like? And and what are their their utensils? One of the things that I thought was really interesting was that we have plates, right, and bowls. Well, they ate out of hollowed out wooden things called trenchers. Uh -huh. And it was very rare to have a knife and a fork. You pretty much just had a spoon. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. But I had no idea. Yeah. And I, you know, no matter what we're researching, you know, you have to, I, I write science fiction. And even with the children's story, I had to do a lot of research on that children's story because I had to be accurate when it came to the caterpillars. Yes. I mean, obviously, the pictorial doesn't show them with, with 12 eyes and six legs, but you know, a real caterpillar has 12 eyes and six legs. Well, so I, I did include that. that in my story. Um, so even in children's story, you, you need to do some research. I think that there are sometimes you can take liberties when it comes to research to where you don't have to be exactly accurate. Um, I, we watch movies all the time, and I know <laughs> this has to drive people crazy because we live here in Las Vegas, Nevada, and a lot of movies get shot here. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen a movie and they'll be showing the sands way before it was imploded, and then they'll show, like, Caesar's Palace, which is really down the street, which is next door on the film, and it's like, wait a minute, this <laughs> yeah. is, that's right. not right. <laughs> yeah. I like yeah. when they start at the airport and go under the tunnel, and suddenly uh, they're downtown. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's exactly. That's how that works. I've gone through that tunnel so many times. It's oh, magic. Oh, okay. And you've been, yeah. you've gone downtown through that tunnel? Yes. <laughs> it's magic. You just pop there, you're like, oh, oh. hey, by the MGM. Uh, we, we don't know about you, Marissa. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you were doing too much studying studying on that one. <laughs> All right. So background research is necessary. Um, if you've got an idea for a novel, it is either set in a time or place or the subject that you, you know little about. Um, and even though you like historical fiction, you probably didn't know as much about it as you thought. Nope, I Because, didn't. like you said, you wouldn't have known what utensils they were using. You wouldn't have known exactly what garments they would have been wearing back then. So... Mm -hmm. And, and you really need that to construct the story. You really need that to even start off. I write science fiction as well. I have a book that's ready to go. I keep saying that every show. <laughs> it's sitting right here. It's almost ready. Um, and uh, that one has a ha – I've done extensive research on that one. But there's a difference, though, in doing extensive research when you're doing it over a long period of time because mine has to have the actual facts in it in order to make mm. the story work or at least be believable. Believable, yeah. Yeah, it's science fiction, but because it's based on Area 51 and mm, um, yeah. theories and possible um, passages from the Bible, you know, you have to be kind of accurate with that. So I have to go back, and I had to make sure that whatever I'm quoting from the Bible is exactly the way it is in the Bible. I had to go back, and I had to make sure that when I'm talking about the Mayans that I knew exactly the time frame, and kind of like what you said, you know. All that was important for the reader because most readers who would have any knowledge about that are going to pick that apart and say, that's so stupid, that, that, that's not right, you know. So we do have to do enough research. Depends on what it is we're writing, you know. Um, I also write drama. I actually wrote one story, though, I will tell you this. Mm -hmm. My very first novel that came out in 1995, um, The Emblem, 
I did it, did very little research on it, and it was so accurate I couldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's because but. you paid attention along the way with everything that's in the emblem mm -hmm. with what is reality. Well, I dreamed that book, mo you know, the premise of that book. So it's interesting how sometimes maybe we pick up things that we don't even know yep. and mm -hmm. that we're not aware of. Yep. And so, you know, through TV or reading or whatever. But so you do wonder, can you overanalyze something? I actually had someone read that novel. It was a government espionage because I, I was never in the military and I really know nothing about the military. But I wrote that book. And <laughs> I had someone who's a retired Air Force colonel read it and he says, James, I'm amazed at how facts be. Because when it came to generals ordering this or that, he'd say, I really don't know what power they have, you know, how much influence they have or power they have to, to order this or order that. So you, those type of things you can take liberty at because who's really going to know except someone in, who's a high official. Mm -hmm. So there are times you can exaggerate your research. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I came in when I was working on Revolutionary Heart. I, I, I had, you know, they always talk about writer's block. Well, I didn't really know where to go. And I, all my life, I'd been writing factual things. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to my mom one day, and she says, Lori, you're writing fiction. Make it up. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, of course. I, I could make yeah, something right, up. Right, it doesn't yeah. have to all be factual. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I know, because in your mind, you the same way I think, people are going to read this, and they're going to say, that's, that, that's not the way it was, you know? Sure. But most people wouldn't know what went on in the 1700s. So I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I have that same problem with the book we're writing right now because I have a character who has a mental illness and I had to make sure I researched that thoroughly because uh, it's a mental illness. I can't tell you what it is yet because that's kind of a spoiler. If uh, anyone okay. like eventually reads it one day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, it's one that's not as well documented and some people might not even think it really exists. So uh, I, I feel a pressure that I have to get it accurate so I don't fall under, like, the same trap of everyone else who writes about it and it's, like, completely inaccurate and kind of offensive. But it gets to the point where um, I kind of... I lost my thought. Well, you were talking about being accurate or not with your... Yeah, and I feel like I have to get it accurate because I don't want to offend anyone, but when you uh, make, your, make it too accurate... You kind of get lost. And, you know, some people aren't going to know. Like in the book that I'm getting ready to finish up here, um, in this book, the, the story takes place under hypnosis. There's six sessions of hypnos hypnos hypnosis <laughs> that the character goes through. I I'll get this out. And um, when he's under, you don't know if what he's – well, he doesn't remember being hypnotized. But anyone who knows anything about um, hi hypnosis – or that type of therapy, you're going to remember yeah. what the questions they ask you when you mm -hmm. come out of that session. You're kind of in a trance, but you still hear everything that's going on. But there are cases where someone does not remember being in that session or what they said. That's very rare, and it certainly would be rare that you remember nothing that the session even started. But because that can happen, I took the liberties of making sure my character doesn't remember anything. Because when we watch TV, most of the time when we watch the television, that's the way it's portrayed anyway. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You yeah, know, oh, well, true. they don't remember anything because they mm -hmm. were under hypnosis. But, you know, anyway, in, in reality, that's not true. Mm -hmm. And, and any time you're feeling like you really need to, to specify everything the way it truly is, watch an old Western. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you'll go, oh, no, that, that never could not <laughs> have happened. <laughs> Watched one the other day, mm -hmm. and, and the, the time frame was like 1870. And this guy was telling this woman, you really need to run for governor. <laughs> <laughs> Not allowed to vote, but yeah. run for, for governor. For governor, right. Yeah. 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 And I'm going, what? And, and, then, and then, like, the next day, my husband's watching this other Western. It's about this woman uh, who owns all this land. We weren't allowed <laughs> to own land. It wasn't until 1960-something before we could have a credit card. You know? Well, there were instances. I remember, um, I don't know how many, if anyone's has researched ever the Mason-Dixie line. Mm -mm. Nope. And there was a situation there where a young lady inherited her father's um, plantation. Because which there is, weren't any male heirs? Right. And the only thing was is that she was of mixed race. Mm. Oh. And they fought her. her wasn't, hers wasn't so much about being a woman that was keeping her from owning it. It was because she was mixed race and mm -hmm. blacks yeah. were not allowed to own land. Right. And that was the first case where someone actually won, and she won. 
that that lawsuit. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So th- it could it could have been there are situations where women were owners, but very rare, you know. I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not running for governor. Well, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, no to that one. But I, I feel you. When I wherever I watch a movie, there's some instances where I get pulled away because I just go, "That that does not how that works." Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we have to remember, it's all for entertainment, mm-hmm. right? Not for accuracy. And when it's fiction, it's fiction. That was the problem I ran into with my. And I, I, there was no need for me to research. Well, I guess I should have researched it. Um, the, the, <laughs> the novel that I put out in 2005 was called uh, uh, Creating God. And the problem with that was is a lot of people felt that it was blasphemy uh-huh. because creating God. Mm-hmm. But in reality, it's a fictional story. And it's just about an alien race that created us, and they were the gods that created us so you know without reading the story that title alone kind of put a damper on on that book so now it's gonna i'm revamping and it's coming out as the alien transcripts dash creating god Uh, (laughs) (laughs) okay Uh, but because that's what it's about it's about an alien and they have the transcripts from the guy who's under hypnosis and he tells their story for the first time ever and so you know there wasn't anything to really research. The only research I can tell you that was done there is when the book was put out and the research came back that no one wanted to buy that book because it was blasphemy. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> uh, so I don't know how you could research a title to find out a reaction um, until you get it out there. I know what we do is we bring our title up to various friends and family and okay. we just ask for their general reaction. And sometimes it's how we settle disputes when we don't know uh, if an element or a plot line Okay. is good. We'll go up to them and be like, if we did this, how do you think you'd react as a reader? Uh, and sometimes they mm-hmm. can tell us, yeah, that'd be cool, or no, don't do not do that. But um, I think for the name, we didn't have too much trouble, did we? Nope. Okay, that was uh, good. I never had a name until the book came out. Everyone I ever told the story to never even thought twice about the title. But I guess seeing it in print, mm. it made people think again you know, about that title. So it's interesting how we go through these. That is interesting because to me, the first thing that came to me was the title. Yeah. The Revolutionary Heart. And that well, that was it. Same with yeah. my book. I, I had the title set in stone. And then, yeah. and then James came over and for two and a half hours, we talked about it. And we changed the title Numerous eight or times, ten yeah. times oh, really? before we finally came up with the title that it is now. Yeah. Oh, wow. Which is not what it what I just knew it was going to be. No, but you know what? <laughs> it fits your story, though, because her book is it, about a clock, uh-huh. and it's about a 147-year-old clock, and all these secrets are hidden inside. So her book's called The Secrets mm. of Time. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, I, like I like that, that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it kind of fit. Yeah. It does. Yeah. 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 It does. But even with mine, with Creating God, a lot of people like that title, even still, today. But the thing is, is that if you're, if you're trying to get your work out there to the masses... You have to go by what, what everybody would want, not mm-hmm. just like a select few. Right. So, you know, I had no choice but to really go back and revamp it. And Plus, it's a better book now because it's mm. been, you know, quite, a, what, 10 years, 12 years, 13 years. So it's been long enough now that I've been able to add to it and, and revamp it and have it re-edited. And, and so I'm kind of glad, to be honest with mm. you. Yeah. Everything's for a reason. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. All right. So we're also going to be talking about background research. Think hard about any project you're considering that will require too long a research period. Sometimes in terms of your career, the learning curve is just too steep. We can probably spend too much time researching. <laughs> it's kind of like yeah. editing. How many times am I going to edit that book? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Till yeah. the end of time. Till the end of time. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it feels like. If, if given the opportunity, James would, and I think he, yeah. I, I've told him numerous times, Stop editing. You're done. Yeah, yeah. And other people have told him the same thing, too. Get it in print. You don't like it. You can change it yeah. later. Yeah. Have it come out again. The first editor I worked with uh, was talking to me one day, and he says, I just don't understand this guy. He's another author. Did uh, he, so many fiction books. I mean, he was like one a year, sometimes maybe two a year. Wow. He says, I don't know how Jerry just says it's done. He says, I go and look at mine and I go over and over and over and over. Mine are never done. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, we know someone who writes how many books? A w- I think she's got 150. 100 she now. writes she's, 10, she's, 10 books a year. Yeah. She's got 50, 54 books out now, yeah. I think. Yeah. She started writing wow. a little over five years ago. Yeah. 
Is she 10 now or what? <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly don't know how. I will tell yeah. you this, though. The one thing that we've talked about, and we're talking about Pam Wynn. Yeah. Um, we both have the same problem. It's a, it's a psychological problem. Your mind never stops wanting to create things. Right. And I do that. Um, I'm one of those who I have vivid dreams. Mm-hmm. So I'll wake up in the morning and I have dreamed an entire book. And I have to write it on paper. And some people don't understand that. Like, why don't you stop doing that and just work on what you have? But you can't because you feel like this story is so good. I can't lose sight of this. So, right. you know, you still have to get that on, on paper, too. And you yeah. may spend several hours just working on that outline alone yeah. just so you have that concept on paper to go back to lately, later. Yeah. And that happens sometimes two, three, four times a week for me. Wow. So yeah. I know it used to be an issue for me when I was um, back in high school, ironically. But because we were focused just on this book solely, I had to kind of type it up, write any notes I could, and then put it on a like, shelf just so yeah. that way I could focus on one thing and not get distracted. Because that was one of my main issues. I couldn't finish anything because I kept developing new stuff and keep forgetting the old ideas. Yeah. It was an issue. Now it, I, I'm a lot better. You know what I found yeah. works for me, too? When I do have a new concept, when I verbally tell that story to someone, and sometimes I'll tell it twice... It's in my head forever after that point. Yeah. So even if I just have the outline in, on the computer or written out in hand, you know, freehand, um, I, that story is in my mind. It, it will not go away. Uh, I can go back 20 years and tell you stories that I created 20 years ago. And oh, I can wow. tell you the exact outline of that story. Because it's just saying it somehow makes it, you know, in, engraved in my mind mm-hmm. as opposed to just writing it. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Well, and the other thing we're going to talk about is spot research. Uh, is the small piece of information you need at a precise moment in the plotting or writing of your novel? What's the actual name of medication, for example? <laughs> you know, yeah. that can be important. Right. I mean, if, if you're talking about hallucinogenic, you need to make sure you mention something mm-hmm. that someone really knows is it a hallucinogenic. Mm-hmm. Um, and then what kind of material, which you were talking about, uh, is mm-hmm. something made of? Like you were talking about the bowl. Right. You know, what yeah. would have they have used back then? Because if there is someone reading a period piece who's going to say they would never have used pewter, that wasn't what they were using back then. Mm-hmm. You know, so you got to know all that. Uh, you might want to know something like, what's a town about 65 miles north of Tulsa, Oklahoma? <laughs> you know, yeah. well, you better right. know that there's a town 65 miles north of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and what <laughs> yeah. the name of that town is. <laughs> that's right. Yes. Um, that's another thing we see in movies all the time. You know, if you see someone at the border of California, like in Prim, you know, they, in 10 minutes they're there and it's like, that can't happen. There's <laughs> no way right. they can be there in 10 right. minutes. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes it, it really, you really should be accurate. Yeah. One of yeah. the things that, that I, I found was, uh, in Boston, what I hadn't realized at the time is that the whole Harbor is totally different now. It has been, uh, backfilled and filled in. Mm-hmm. And so if you look at a map, a modern day map, it looks totally different than what it did back then. And yeah. part of mine, I have people rowing back and forth to different places, and it's like, well, could they get there from there? And uh-huh. and then, like, how long does it take you to get from one town to another on horseback? Mm-hmm. Right. Where do you find that information? Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. right. right. Yeah. Well, you know, even with water flow, like I think the Mississippi shifted a couple times or, mm-hmm. you know, as far as its flow. So you would have to know, what, what which direction is the water flowing in during that period of time? Right. Um, mm-hmm. Sounds odd, but you would need to know that. So, and covered wagons coming across country, they moved on an average of fifteen miles a day. Mm-hmm. So, wow. when yeah, <laughs> so they didn't do it in a week or a weekend. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was months and months. When you're doing your research for the radio show, um, what kind of topics is it you're researching? Um. We talk a lot about, uh, uh, I don't know how to explain it. It's like writing and editing. Um, like we have, we've been talking about different types of editing recently. Uh, we went over line editing because uh, I don't think that many people know exactly what it is or they might confuse it with something else. Um, sometimes we do uh, like uh, tips. like uh, We do tips. We uh, My favorite for the educational side, because we do do some games just to have entertainment side of it, is we go into subgenres. The last one we did was splatterpunk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's just really really gory. It's, it's like oh, saw. It, it's gotcha. saw. It's just it's horror and gore without a roof. There's no limits, and 
we go into like elements and tropes and some books if people kind of want to get into it because I know we learned a lot from it too because we did magical realism which I thought it was something else mm -hmm. and then we actually looked it up and it was like oh my god I think I was wrong for years <laughs> <laughs> I think I like this <laughs> and so we focus a lot on educating certain aspects of writing um talking about kind of characters that we do enjoy and why because some part of you know when you read a book it's a little um subjective what you why you like a character other than just the writing itself yeah and then we play a lot of fun games huh. yeah and you know we we always are having to research a lot of things and you started reading books that you would never have read before Steampunk. before we started this show and, yeah. you know, it is interesting. You, you hear something and you think, I'll, I wouldn't like that. But then you start reading it and mm -hmm. you're thinking, you know, this is really interesting. Yeah. And Bizarro Horror is the one we just learned about from, <laughs> <laughs> you know, from one of our guests, yeah. Russell Holbrook. Right. And, um, you know, it sounds fun. It wasn't what I thought. It's more comical than anything. Yeah. Um, so it has a, a, a funny twist to it. It's kind of like Evil Dead. Has anyone seen mm -hmm. yes, Evil Dead? Yeah, I like Evil Dead. Have you seen Evil Dead? I have Dead? not okay. seen Evil Dead. Lori, I have to tell you, I thought I would not like that. I thought this is horrible. Are we and talking it, zombies? No. It's, okay. It's, it's someone who's basically, um, I don't, it's, it's like a horror movie where they're in, the, in this, not a vent, but they're in this part of the house that has a hidden door, mm -hmm. and, and they come out and they kill people and there's this guy who's lost his arm and it becomes a what he what does he put on there it's like a, um a, uh, like a, uh, when you cut down trees we yeah an an yeah, yeah uh, a chainsaw oh. So, oh. He, oh. so the chainsaw becomes his arm and then he's killing the bad guys with the chainsaw <laughs> Awesome. It's so funny, I have to tell you. <laughs> and I thought I wouldn't like it, but it was it was hysterical. It really okay. was. So you never I'll know. You, you don't. Know. You yeah. just don't know until you at least it, you know, adventure. Mm -hmm. And you really have to adventure into everything because it's unbelievable how talented so many of these people yeah, are. Yeah. And we, you know, by not looking at or reading or, or testing the waters, we're the ones that are losing out. Mm -hmm. And the exactly. entertainment factor of it is just unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> well, because we have a preconceived notion of what we think we like. Yeah. And, you know, we do have certain things that we, we gear our, our attention to, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can't expand your horizons a little bit and, and see. It's kind of like travel. You know, a lot of people, when they go to travel, um, I went to Europe, I was going on a tour, and on the tour, they have you do this, they have you do that, they have you do this. And I'm thinking, I don't want to just stick to the tour, you know. So then I added Germany, I added <laughs> Switzerland, you know, and I added all these places. And I'm so glad I did, you yeah. know. I don't want to do the touristy thing. I want to really see the people. Mm -hmm. I want to get out there with the people in the country yeah. and mm -hmm. see how they live and what their life is about. Sure. Well, that's exactly what we're talking about, you know. And that's yeah. research, by the way. Mm -hmm. A lot of what we should be researching is everyday life. Yes. What we live, um, finding your place, finding your sp how to get here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got yeah, lost. Yeah, right. I was a block away, okay, a one block away. <laughs> it's okay, we only got here because we were here for um, his event. <laughs> That's how he told us where it was. Like, you know where the event was? Yeah, same place. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. <laughs> uh, research. <laughs> Let's see, I, I, I got, got to be, see, I was just on the other end of the parking lot lost. <laughs> 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 it's true. <laughs> it was true. Uh, yeah, but you know, we research everything in life, and we don't even realize it sometimes. But yeah. we really do. When you go to the store, you're researching. You know what what store is going to have what. You know, you got to look up online. You know wh who's going to have this? How can I go find it? I just did that today. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to a phone, you know, for a certain mm -hmm. person. So you know, we we spend a lot of time researching. We don't even think about probably a lot of hours, and we just think. You know, it's just normal nowadays to go online and look up something. I remember the days when there was no online. You had to go to the library. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my favorite, my favorite thing at Ohio State was the library. At the time, they had over 6 million books in oh, this one, one facility. Jeez. And it was absolutely lovely. And, you know, the smell when you're in the stacks. But literally, there were books that I would check out that were published in the 1800s where I was slitting the pages because nobody had ever checked that book out before. And being a oh. reader, oh. that was just, I, I have goosebumps now because it was just so incredible. Yeah. yeah. But one of the things that when, when we're researching, especially, 
we, you, we you find research everywhere, but don't be afraid to talk to people um, yeah, about your project because yeah. you never know who they're going to talk to or who they know. I found great friends who are members of the Daughters of the American Revolution, the mm-hmm. a DAR, and uh-huh. they, you know, hooked me up with several different people and I could talk to them because they're really into the research and uh-huh. things like that. But also the Library of Congress. My favorite story is I wanted to read the newspapers of the time, where to find them. Well, I'd watched some sort of video, and the Library of Congress is putting everything on the web. Perfect, you know, loc.gov, right? Except for what I wanted. That wasn't there. Uh. But they had a little link as the librarian. So I said, Uh. well, how long will it take to get a response? I had a response the very next day. Wow. And she said, well, there's a repository of these newspapers at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And I was like, well, that's seven miles from my house. I think <laughs> I think I think I could probably, you know, You're handle there. that, right? Yeah. 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 So you never know where, where you'll do it. But you know, the more people you talk to, word gets around and then pretty soon people start coming back to you. Hey, have you looked at this? Have you you know checked this out? Yeah. It's helpful. I belong to something years ago here in Las Vegas and back in the 80s. And I was wanting to find information on it because we didn't have the Internet back then. And so it's really hard to find anything, you know, beyond the 90s, you know, when it comes to newspaper or whatever. A lot of the newspapers don't have archives like they used to either. Mm -hmm. So what I found was I could go to the library and they have the microfiche. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can actually put those slides underneath there. It's time-consuming. But, you know, if, if you want to really research, you can go there and find everything. You know, they do keep those files. That's what I was reading. Yeah. yeah. It's just my really education. annoying. I've done it for my job. Yeah. yeah. But that's, I'm looking at engineering plans. So I, I hope looking at, in, you know, newspapers is a little more entertaining than that. Yeah. <laughs> it d- depends on how good the microfiche copy is. Your Very eyes could right. go googly. Right. <laughs> right. What I found was so many ads. I was going through those things. I'm thinking, <laughs> how many ads do I have to see before I find what I want? Yeah. You know. <laughs> well, the newspapers back then, very similar to newspapers back, you know, that we have today. Half of it's ads. Yeah. Yes. Ha- yeah. Literally half of it's That's ads. It's got to pay for the people that's printing the yeah. Printing yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. But it's it's crazy. I mean, literally these people would get get their shipments in from wherever and that I think they listed absolutely everything. Yeah. Absolutely everything. Yeah. It's just crazy. And then, you know, there's the the person that ran away and the guy that says, uh, my wife's ran away and I'm no longer responsible for her her Uh debt. So if you have anything, I'm not going to pay that. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Remember those days. Well, you know, what's interesting, too, is even when, when we've lived life, if you had anything that was documented anywhere, I'm one of those that like. Did I remember that correctly? So I always go back and research that just to make sure I'm accurate about myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know why that's important is I helped someone with a book, and she wrote the book based on her life, what she recalled. But then her husband wrote his chapter, and then you had the daughters, and everybody remembers it differently. Differently. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes, but she kept journals. So sometimes having a reference to go back to is one way, you know, to make sure it's it's accurate, which is that's research. Mm-hmm. You know, having had her journals, that helped her research what she needed to put in that book. Mm-hmm. Although they still all disputed it, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. just because you wrote it there doesn't mean it was true. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Marissa and Haley, you're right. Your book is written from three different perspectives, mm-hmm. right? Yes, yes, it is, and it's a. Uh, it's always interesting to keep um, kind of how they each see what's going on. Each person views people differently. Uh huh. And, uh, yeah, don't know where I was going, but <laughs> <laughs> you're not even that old. <laughs> no, but we are no. tired. <laughs> Sleep is for the week at this point when you're a college student. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Are, you, are you, st- you're still not in session now though, are you? No, but no, okay. it feels like we So are. what's the excuse? <laughs> oh, well, we have podcasts, we have work, we have the oh, book. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, we're actually helping a friend develop a video game as well. So Whoa. we see him once every week to now deliver. Now, when you say develop a video game, what, what are you talking about? Um, we handle story, so I, I guess. So we're, write, we're doing the writing for it, and we're outlining the story of the video game. And we also do some bit of level design, like we're uh, kind of designing uh, the 
enemies they have to face. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Are you doing that? You're doing the, the actual uh, work on the computer then for the, d- no. the program? No. We're no. just, uh, we're just uh, writing the dialogue and uh, we're coming up with ideas for it. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, they do want us to go in there and talk about weaponry and essentially write out a paragraph about how the uh, this animal looks. Mm-hmm. So uh-huh. we can hand it over to the art people. Yep. Yeah. Uh huh. So you're probably doing a lot of research for that. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. More than I would like. I know way too much about forest animals now because <laughs> that's the first stop, and <laughs> they want 15 of them, and uh-huh. it gets interesting. I go with porcupines. They're always bad. Yeah, uh, yeah. Bad. Surprisingly <laughs> enough. We haven't actually used porcupines. That's like the one animal we didn't use. You know, what's interesting is even writing the children's story. The purple caterpillar, by the way, is the name of the children's story. Uh, (laughs) Get a little plug there. Good plug. In writing that, Veronica, um, Jan's daughter-in-law, had to go back. And we had, when she she brought me the, the, the finished product, we had to go over it and... Even then, we had to go back and I'd say, you know, we got to do this, we got to do that. So there is, you, she had to go back and reference what she's sketching to make sure what she's doing is is mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. It, There's research in all things. I mean, yeah, I, there is. And no matter what we do, you know, yeah. it, life is about research. It's like learning. It is learning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is learning. It yeah, is. exactly. Does anyone else have anything they would like to add to this? I think. I did all the research I could possibly do on the subject that I wrote about in my book by living my life because uh, what my story entails at the ending, the whole reason behind the story was uh, somebody else wanting people to, to live their life a certain way. And I had a situation come up in my life where I couldn't possibly live up to their expectations and be justified with myself. So... My book, th- all the research I did basically for my book was on myself. So that uh, that's what I have to add. <laughs> there are so many times I'll go to research something and I don't even know what direction to go in or what to put in the computer to find out. And I, I, I'll type something a dozen times different ways until hopefully something will pop up that you know I can reference. Just mm-hmm. this topic on research today, I, I wasn't wanting the word research, which they give you the dictionary. <laughs> you yeah. know, I was actually wanting to, I was putting in, you know, different ways to write it, like, how do you write about research? <laughs> 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 uh, you yeah. know, so, yeah. you know, you kind of got to have some idea of how you want to approach it when you're trying to find out certain things, or you're not going to get the answer you want. I'm trying to remember what it was yesterday. I was working on something yesterday, and, and that, that happened to me. I couldn't get the answer I wanted, and it was because of I didn't know how to ask the question. Right. So asking the right question is important to getting the right answer when it comes to our research as well, especially yeah. if it's something we're unfamiliar with. Yeah, but that's where the, where the, the Internet comes in so handy because can you imagine trying to do that through a card catalog? That would make you crazy. Yeah, but at, at least I get crazy just with the internet. Yeah, I do too. I do too. Yeah, every once in a while, I'm amazed I still have hair. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but one one thing that I found that that really helped me a lot because, again, writing historical fiction, the language is different. I knew right away uh, I yeah. didn't want to talk like they did because that could just be so cumbersome, and I mm-hmm. didn't want to have to learn how to do that anyway. But I thought the least I could do is to make sure that I'm using the right words, the right vocabulary yeah. Yeah. for the time. Yeah. And one of the things that I found out, and this was literally right before I finished Revolutionary Heart, the, the very you know, the culmination of everything, and a fire starts. And I said, oh, well, you know, it was started by a lantern. And I thought, you know, I always look up these words. I should look up this word. Lanterns didn't come about until the 1800s. <gasps> oh. See, it's a good thing you researched. Yes, it had uh, to be an huh. oil lamp. Uh, had to be uh, an oil lamp. Yeah. yeah. I'm learning so much today. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I am too. I, I always learn. Uh, you know, that that is really interesting. To find but dictionary.com uh-huh. is wonderful. It will tell you, you know, word origins. Uh huh. And so that's that's become my go-to. Well, I've never really written a period piece, so I haven't had to worry too much about that. 
But like I was telling you with the documentaries mm-hmm. that um, I based my story on, I, I do kind of have to, because we got to realize that when we're writing something too, even with mine being fiction, um, and even if they're theories, people are going to be watching that thinking, thinking about the theories that are out there. Mm-hmm. So it, even if it's just a theory, you've got to be accurate on that. Einstein's theory of relativity is an example. You know, I had a, a my uh, I had to figure out how can I show how old my aliens are because in my story they're seventy five thousand years old. One character, but how would that be possible even mm-hmm. on Einstein's theory of relativity? So I had to come up with something that's plausible. So I had to go back and research how old would you be in space if you're if you're a hundred years old on Earth? How old would you be in space? So you know you go through all those literal quantum physics you figure it all out i mean there is an answer Mm -hmm. and then you have to realize well if they are that old they couldn't have entered an atmosphere because once you enter an atmosphere you would age and die all this is in my book i had to explain this out Mm. for the reader to get where how i could justify this character being that old sure so that took a lot of research (laughs) i mean i know we can over research but also if you don't give enough information Everyone's going to say, there is no way a character could be that old. Yeah. Well, you'll, you'll have lots and lots of research, but you may not use it all. But what it does is it places you in that time period. Well, for me, in, in that time period, for you, you know, gives you that background. Whether or not you use it, it comes through because of how you can write. And it sounds like you know what you're talking about because you do. Yeah. Well, I don't know that I do, but, you know. <laughs> like, I hope I do. Yeah, I just want to make them think I do. You know, okay, so. well, you're successful at that, James. <laughs> yes. Uh, See, I keep myself from over-researching, because I have this, what I call, like, a two-check method, where I find the information, and then I'm like, if I can find it again, it's most likely correct. Sometimes I'll do three right. if I'm really nervous about it, and then I'll, uh, and then I'll just take that information and be like, okay, this is good. I can trust it. Mm-hmm. There's a few times we'll research something and we go to a different website and we hear the exact opposite. Sure. Mm-hmm. And uh-huh. it's like, well, how do I, wh- what's right? And then you have to go in and try to find what's, I guess, more popular belief mm-hmm. for some things that we've done. Yeah. 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 All right. Jane, you have anything to add there? Nope. No? No. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I do want to talk a little bit about publishing because you started out, Lori, as a mm-hmm. publisher. And you started out before there was a digital age. I, I yeah. did as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's interesting because y- the two young ladies that are here <laughs> would don't even understand what it means not to have an internet. Uh, yeah, no, really, no, no, we don't. <laughs> they don't even understand what anything beyond a cell phone is, like <laughs> the old landline. <laughs> I don't remember that, but I know when like I was around when the flip phone was the biggest thing you could have, and then yeah. my mother actually had dial-up. Uh-huh. So uh-huh. I do know what that screeching sound was. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. yeah. That's good. So. Yeah, but you don't remember the party line where if you pick up the phone, someone's <laughs> talking on the other end. No. no. Can I use the phone now? <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> um, but, you know, the thing is, is that that's, see, and that's important. That'll be a part of mm-hmm. research. I mean, you're mm-hmm. talking only like 20, 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. But for you, you would have to research that because back in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and even the 80s, mm-hmm. Everything changed. Everything's changed so much since then. I saw a payphone yesterday. <gasps> really? Where? I, a real payphone. <laughs> is it working? Does, is yeah. It working? Where? Wow. At Harris, in the back of Harris. <laughs> I swear. I couldn't believe it. Really? There was a payphone. There's I, one in the uh, hospital at UMC, actually. I've used really? It. Yeah, it still oh. works, uh, which is great for when you for, like can't find your cell phone. Yeah, yeah. Or it dies. But wow. I, thought there, I didn't wow. think there was ever any more cell phones around anymore. Pay I mean, not pay phone. <laughs> pay phone. No. Well, I've been well, worried. Well, that, I'm 10 years ahead of myself. We're telepaths. We're telepaths. It'll be an implant you get when you're born, so all you got to do is touch your forehead. And, this is and another one go. of those dreams I'm having. <laughs> it's a daydream. Quick, write it down. <laughs> I mean, at least yeah. that way you can never lose it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, not necessarily. <laughs> but you know what? I've actually seen people who walk around with a thing in their ear. They, sure. There is no cell phone. Yeah, and they phone. just go and pop up, yeah. pop on their ear yeah. all day. So Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure why. We, we must all be getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> Do your research. <laughs> Do your all right. research. But I wanted to just talk a little bit about how the fact when you started out and I started out mm-hmm. in, in publishing, I actually published my first book in 1995, which wasn't that long ago. 
And we didn't have any digital at all. Mm. It was all done by plates. And mm-hmm. you pl- literally there was a sheet that had eight negatives on it, eight yep. separate pages. Yep. And that's how they would send that through the printer, and, and they would go through the printer, and they'd copy them. Then and you have to proof those? And, yeah. And mark then, them up? Yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah. they would mark those up. That's exactly right. I remember going and looking at the plates. Yeah. So it was it was <laughs> totally different. And they had these... Big sheets of paper. And wow. huge machines. They had these gigantic machines that this would be fed into. You could probably have a thousand computers in that thing <laughs> today. Yeah. Oh my so, God. Yeah. They were huge. They were a, a huge room. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I went. To, I remember I went to Virginia and visited the printer well, to fun. see how that was going to be done. Yeah. So, yeah, that's how much we've advanced. But without researching it, you wouldn't know. And except I do. But <laughs> <laughs> and me. Yeah. And her. But, you know, I mean, you know, for, for you, if you're writing something about the 70s and mm-hmm. someone's writing something or printing something, you would have to go back and research that because that's it's not like what you think. Right. And I think that's what you were getting at, Lori. You could have written your book what you thought was accurate without ever, ever going back and doing any research. Right. And it probably could slide by, mm-hmm. but there's always going to be th- – those few people who are going to say that's not correct. Yeah. So sometimes it is important to go back and do a little well, research. It was important to me to be accurate. Yeah. I needed that for me. Yeah. yeah. Well, you it, think back into the '60s and the '70s, and I I think of that because of the Vietnam era. If I s- was sending a, a friend a letter who who was over in Vietnam, I had to put an airmail stamp on it. Oh yes. Stamps came in so many different numbers and digital dollar factors because, and it cost 10 cents to send airmail. <laughs> and that's if you want it to get there within the week. Because yeah. a regular stamp was three cents. So, yeah. yeah, but yeah. you might not see the, the thing for a month. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> I don't know what those planes were doing. <laughs> <laughs> They all had to go by plane. That was what <laughs> always fried me. But it was, yeah, put it on the plane and then hold it because it doesn't have enough money. Yeah. And then there's the flip side of this. There's some things you just can't research. There's just some things you wouldn't know. And even with today's uh, scientific knowledge, there are things that I wrote in my book that you wouldn't know exactly. I mean, in, in given time, we will know. Because in my story, the character metamorphosizes because they're in space so long to where it, we do know that the body changes in space. That if you're there long enough that you, you do lose mass in, in the lower quadrant and the, the upper quadrant becomes larger. Uh, I think there was one astronaut that was two inches taller when they were in space mm-hmm. and when, you know, when they came back. Mm, yeah. So just little tidbits of what we know about space, you can take that and calculate that into what you you know, presume would happen, but we don't know that for sure. So you can only research so far on some things hmm. yeah. and then the rest of it's just pure speculation. So, uh, you know, obviously if it's a period piece, that wouldn't be the case, but. Well, um. I speculated a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Here and there. Well, there might be some things you couldn't find. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, all right, I do want to go over again. Where can we find uh, more information about your book, Lori? Um, sure. Uh, my website is lauripetrowski.com, L-O-R-I-P-I-O-T-R-O-W-S-K-I. But you can just Google Revolutionary Heart. Um, you know, that's that, that will get you there, too. It's uh, on Amazon. It's on Goodreads. Revolutionary Spirit um, is uh, actually, it's, it's, for, it's on sale now for, at Amazon, but it's not going to be live until July 2nd. And we're going to make our big debut over the 4th of July. Uh-huh. Uh, cool. uh, period, Marvelous. So. Now, you're self-published, is that correct? I am self-published, okay. yes. And when you went about self-publishing, did you go through Create Space or did you... How how are you, how you, how did you go about that? I did use Create Space. Okay, I did use. Uh, I had a couple of other friends who had uh, found ab- out about it and really liked it and thought you know, that the process was worthwhile. Yeah. So I used it. And I think I want to let the listeners know that Create Space is going to the wayside. Oh really? Yeah, they're switching over. Uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, Amazon, you know, they have Kindle, which mm-hmm. has your your e readers, right. and they started their own publication division. So basically, pretty much everything from Create Space is shifting over to Kindle, and it'll be Kindle Publishing. Oh, well, just a different name. Well, there. Um, are, from what I was reading today, under my research, um, <laughs> 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 which was not easy to find. Um, from everything I could gather, you're going to transfer your files over to, to Kindle, which, by the way, both are owned by Amazon. Right. 
So I, to me, it would be just easy for them just to take the files themselves and transfer over, and you do do nothing, I would think. But anyway, yeah. I was reading you may have to transfer your files to mm -hmm. Kindle. Mm -hmm. um, I know. We talked to Katie. Um, I can never pronounce her last Salidus. name. Salidas. Thank you. Um, I'm glad I'm not the only one with that problem. <laughs> yes. No, I, I always struggle with it. She, uh, we went to a, like a seminar of hers, mm -hmm. and she goes over uh, CrateSpace and its process going over to Kindle. So if you are concerned about that, um, we can get you into contact with her. Mm. Yeah. Just so that mm. way... Well, I want to know for my, my listeners, because this is what we yeah. do, too. You know, right. With the show, we try mm -hmm. to inform. But if I can't get at the accurate information from the Internet, you know, um, I can't really. I don't want to put anything out there that I don't know for certain. Mm -hmm. sure. yeah. But what I do know for certain is, is CreateSpace is going to go to the wayside. Yes. Um, I do know that they're owned by Amazon, just like Kindle's owned by Amazon. So to me, I'm speculating, but I would assume as authors, we're really going to have to do very little because it's just a matter of transferring the files over into a different name. Mm -hmm. Instead of create space, it'll be Kindle Publishing. So I'm not sure. Well, I'm going to find mm -hmm. out more for our listeners in the future. You know, it's important for us to know that. Sure. Yeah. Um, Girls, how about you? How do we get in contact with you or find out or learn more about you? Try to do it this time? Um, well, you can. <laughs> if you want to learn. Uh, if, um, I can't talk today either. It's, it's been a trial. <laughs> We are on Facebook. We're at facebook.com slash authors training. Um, oh. Sometimes the uh, in training gets thrown to the wayside because we can't fit it all. Uh, we are on Podbean. I actually don't Authors in training dot Podbean dot com. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, we are running out of time. We're down to the last few minutes of the show. I would like to pitch my new story, The Purple Caterpillar. <laughs> Jan, you want to? This is the most magnificent little book. <laughs> ever yeah uh, it, it's uh, authored by james kelly <laughs> and it's the, called the purple caterpillar it's got the most beautiful artwork in it <laughs> you're gonna see your kids are gonna love this it's for all ages from newborn on so i suggest anybody who's about to have a baby gonna have a grandbaby a niece a nephew whatever baby coming get this book before they get here uh, it's well, I don't think a baby could read it, but <laughs> <laughs> baby doesn't have to read it. It will enjoy the pictures and the illustrations in it are done by Veronica L. Williams, uh, who happens to be uh, uh, a relative of Jan's, <laughs> <laughs> my daughter-in-law. Well, you know what? The, the reason I wrote this story is, is it really does. It's it's a children's story, and it's about the adventures of a caterpillar and going through the metamorphosis of becoming a butterfly. And mm. two school children find these caterpillars and take them back to their classroom. And then the story takes place in two different settings, that from the caterpillar to the classroom, and then when the caterpillars emerge, they let them go, and they go back to butterflies, mm. and they're in their own school. But it <laughs> teaches lessons about bullying, indifference, um, social prejudice. All this is what the whole story is about. Yeah. But it's told in a way that kids can possibly understand it and grasp what you know how we should be treating each other mm -hmm. and that you know the beauty is from inside not the outside mm -hmm. so that's what the purple, ca <laughs> that's what the purple <laughs> caterpillar sorry we're just all having flashbacks uh, to like middle school it's just like you know <laughs> i wish my classmates had read this book then. yes <laughs> you didn't like me because i was tall <laughs> yeah well <laughs> and, and the only thing is about my caterpillar is he's purple it's kind of like the the Remember the, um, what was it, the Black Swan? There was the a book ugly out duckling. Yes. Yeah. The, the Ugly, ugly duckling. duckling. It's got all remnants of that, those stories in there, but it's also told from a schoolyard perspective with the little boy and the little girl, and the little boy's a bully, and she teaches him, stop being a bully, team up with me, maybe we can both get an A, and they do. So yeah. it changes the way he perceives life and the way he people look at him. Yes. So those are the lessons in that book. Great. And I would like to say that, first of all, I'd like to thank our guest, Marissa Hunt, uh, Haley Harper and Lori Petrowski. <laughs> Good job. Uh, to find more about our show, just go to aspectsofwriting.com. That's aspectsofwriting.com. We're also on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash aspectsofwriting. Uh, they take our show from there, and we're on Roku TV and a few others. I think Livestream is one of them. Of course, we're on iHeartRadio, iTunes, amfm247.com. That's the main one for us because yeah. that gives us our worldwide network. We're on 14 terrestrial stations. Um, we're also on Roku TV. I think I said that. Uh -huh. And then we're on Blog Talk Radio as well on Sundays. So this, right. uh, this show always airs on Saturday at 1 um, on amfm247.com network. And then we re 
play this show again on Sundays at 9 o'clock on Block Talk Radio. Yeah. So I'd like to thank everyone again for being on the show. And this is your host, James Kelly, reminding you, if you can dream it, you can write it. Thank you, everyone, for being on the show. Thank you. Thank James. you for having us. Thank you. Thank you.